Hello, it's Roger Bisbee from Skill Builder here, and we're about to do another major test, probably our biggest test, the one that's proved most popular on Skill Builder, which is the 18 volt drill test. A lot of people have been asking us for that test because lots has happened since we did our last one, and we wanted to make it a little bit more all embracing, wider, bring in a few more manufacturers. And of course, that also meant that we've got to look at batteries anew because when we did our last 18 volt test, the batteries, the Makita for example, only had three amp hour batteries out. Now, of course, they've got four amp hour, five amp hour, and even six amp hour batteries out. So everything's moved on. So the test is going to be different. But it occurred to me that if I'm going to talk about batteries, in with the 18 volt test it's going to become this massive great test which a lot of people will find a little bit like gone with the wind and i think we need to chop it up so what i'm doing here is i'm just going to look at the batteries you can link this through to the 18 volt test in your own time maybe in a couple of chunks or you can watch it all in one go but the links will be across the two videos so that you can see because if you're testing power tools you can't ignore the batteries a lot of the advance has come in batteries and really this is where the race is if you like this is where the value is in power tools the actual motor the gearbox and so on is only half the story there's a lot of money tied up in the batteries so i mentioned that makita have come along with their tool, but over the years, since we started using cordless tools and back in the day when we had the old NICAD batteries, I've seen a huge change. And NICAD was pretty nasty stuff. It had to go because it was bad in the landfill, terrible pollutant, it kills fish, it kills human beings. It's just not great stuff to have in the landfill. So to get rid of that out of the ecosystem, if you like, was highly necessary. We then went to nickel metal hydride, which was a safer option, gave us a bit more runtime, and of course it didn't suffer from the memory effect that Nike had had. In other words, you didn't have to run it flat before you recharged it. You could just pop it back on the charger. But a few little problems with nickel metal hydride, it wasn't fantastic in many respects. And just around the corner was lithium iron which gives you twice the power density and less weight. So fantastic leap forward. But there was a problem with lithium iron. And the problem is that if you put it in a high drain situation, if you started drawing big current through it, it would overheat and could burst into flames. And they did have early examples of that happening with all kinds of things, even laptops. So it became necessary to work out how they were going to manage the system and how they were going to prevent not just the you know the dramatic burst into flames but damage to the cells which can occur very easily so the way to do it was sophisticated sophisticated computer chips they got a chip in the charger they got a chip in the battery in actual fact a little printed circuit board is quite a lot more than a chip it looks almost like a, a computer and they've also got one in the power tool that's the better guys are doing that the other ones aren't so with those three things talking to each other they could monitor what was going on and they could prevent these kind of overheat situations these high drain situations occurring and prevent damage to the, the battery because the number one enemy of batteries all batteries not just the lithium ion but all batteries is heat and lithium ion is particularly susceptible to that i've got to put my teeth in today and when we say heat we're only actually talking about 65 degrees centigrade anything over that starts to cause problems to the cells and it can permanently damage the cells so it's important to keep that temperature low now you might think 65 degrees centigrade that sounds fairly hot it's not that hot i mean it's hot water temperature certainly it's what you get when you heat a cylinder up but on a on a roof in the summer even in england my solar panels are giving 140 degrees centigrade so if a guy's working on a roof and he's got his power tool lying there he's got his drill lying there on the flat roof on the in the sun or whatever sorry not on the flat roof on the pitch roof in the sun and he's drawing up heat into that battery and then he goes and picks up the power tool and he goes to do something like an auger bit through a bit of a joist and the thing cuts out and he thinks, oh, this is no good. I've only just bought this. It's not working very well. In actual fact, it's doing him a favour because if it carried on working, it would soon damage that battery irrevocably. And then, of course, he would be going back for a warranty claim. So 
it's important to keep the heat down. It's important not to leave your, your power tools and your batteries in particular out there in the sun. Don't try and charge them in the sun. Put your battery charger in a shady place. Don't leave your batteries on the dashboard of your van or even in a very hot van there. They're not great. So use them cool and you'll get an awful lot more out of them. The other thing that causes overheat is when you do things like selecting second gear on your drill and driving that auger a bit through. That's inexperience. Sometimes we do it by mistake and suddenly realize what we've done. But if you carried on like some idiots used to, just carry on holding the trigger, trying to get this thing through, you'd very soon see smoke coming out of the windings. Now, happily, with the better tools, that's a thing of the past because they've now got electronic cell protection in there. They've got overheats in the tools themselves. You've got this three-way dialogue between the charger, the battery, and the power tool to prevent this happening. The point at which they cut out is different on different tools, but they're all trying to stay below this critical 65 degrees centigrade that I talked about. So in many cases, you can just take the finger off a trigger, wait for it to cool down, and then start it again. Sometimes you can just run a bit of air through, but if it's the battery that's overheated, a lot of the time it needs to come back to the charger. And the charger will have a look at it, do a bit of diagnostics on it, blow a bit of air through it, and then if it needs to charge, it will start charging it. But that won't happen straight away. I mean, if it was a hot day and it was in a hot situation, it may take an hour before it actually started charging it. So again, it can show up a fault. They've got temperature. They will sometimes tell you on the chargers when it's an overheat situation. But the important thing is that because we've got these air vents going through the, the batteries, it will cool it down. And if you look at the Bosch one, for example, they've got a cool pack battery, which actually puts space between the cells. And that means that there's air blowing all the way through those cells and that keeps it considerably cooler. And they're saying that because of that, because they're keeping it way below that 65 degrees critical temperature, running it that much cooler means that the battery lasts a lot longer. So they're claiming twice the life for their battery compared to their predecessors. Now, when it's charging, it shows a light to say that it's fully charged. And in actual fact, what I found out that it's not necessarily fully charged. On a sophisticated charger, it will show up fully charged, ready for use at around 85%. But because you've got this situation where you're trying to put a charge in without overheating the battery, as the battery gets to full capacity and it's trying to put that last bit in, it can't do it too fast. If it does it too fast, it'll just cook the battery. So all it's doing is squirting a little bit of juice in there, it's just trickle charging it. And that trickle charge from 85 to 100% can take as long again as the initial charge. So you could say you've got a one hour charge on the battery, but actually to get it up to 100% could end up taking two hours. So all these batteries that I've been putting on ready for test, I've had them on all night so that we can make sure they've all got 100% charge in them before we start. And of course I've been charge them overnight which is cooler so that's a good thing and they'll be all ready to go but on some of the cheaper tools that you might get you might they might say they've got a four amp hour battery five amp hour battery on them you think that's great but it's only ever reaching 85 percent because on a cheaper less sophisticated charger they just won't bother to try and ch trickle charge that last bit of power into the battery they just give up at the 85 percent so you may never actually be getting the full capacity out of your battery but with these ones they've all got a trickle charge capability which is why we've really just stuck to testing the brands we're really not interested in the the other ones and of course the other thing we found is that since i did the last test the batteries have got larger and larger as i mentioned and it means we've now got five amp hour six amp hour and look at this fella this is from milwaukee 9 amp hour just isn't necessary for something like an 18 volt cordless tool. The reason that's been developed is because Milwaukee have just brought out an SDS Max drill. In fact, when I say just brought it out, depends when you're watching this because we've got uh, news of that before the launch, but it's due to be launched in February in Europe 2016. Massive leap forward because that puts them up there near the mains powered machines. It means that people don't have to carry a generator. If they want to do a bit of SDS Max work, they can stick this nine amp hour battery in there and away they go. 
I would always say that if you can, you're better off plugging into a mains power supply or something like that, because this battery is not going to be cheap and it won't drill that many holes, but it will get you out of trouble. And if it saves having to lug a transformer out to a remote job, then there's going to be a market for it for sure. But it is one of those things that's just a quantum leap forward. But as for the rest of it, I really don't see that there's any point in this going much higher than the five amp hour battery. On an 18 volt drill, when you start putting too much bulk into it, you're starting to negate the whole purpose of having a nice portable convenient power tool anyway, so keep it light. I mean, there may be plenty of situations where even an 18 volt is overkill. A lot of guys are quite happy with their 14.4 volts when they're doing kitchen fitting and so on and uh, they do everything that they want them to do. But if you want a good all rounder, then the 18 volt seems to be the one that most people in the UK like. So just one more thing to say, I think as a passing thought is that these batteries aren't cheap, you know that. And if one of the cells goes down, that means the whole battery's had it and it'll show up a fault and you end up chucking it away. And I think that's a terrible waste because a lot of the value in these batteries is now in the circuitry that's inside. That little printed circuit board is a very important part of the battery and of course, a very expensive part of the battery. And to chuck that away just because you've got a couple of cells gone down is no good thing. Now there are aftermarket guys around, a lot of uh, small firms out there who will put new cells into the battery for you. But of course you don't know what you're getting. You don't know what the quality control on those guys is. And I think it's high time manufacturers started doing a refurbishment service on the batteries. You know, you send them away, get them reselled for a fraction of the cost of a new one. And if they did that, I think, you know, they'd be doing us a favor because, you know, this is a lot of money for a battery and we really expect to get good service out of it and not have to chuck a perfectly good battery away just because one cell goes down. The new, more sophisticated batteries, again, Bosch are just bringing it in. They're starting to monitor the cells individually. Well, not individually, actually in pairs, but they can tell when one of the two cells is starting to play up and they will reduce the capacity of the battery to save damage to the other cells. A bit of a sophisticated thing because I think what happens is that the, the other cells try to recharge the dud one or something like that, and so it can, can cause a problem. But anyway, that's, that's going way beyond what I know about it. The other thing I discovered taking these batteries apart the other week when I was having a bit of a play is that some of them have got a fuse in them, which I didn't know. And that fuse is there because sometimes these are fairly well protected, these terminals, but in the old ones, you could get a situation where you just got a couple of screws touching the terminals and that caused the short in the battery and that could cause a fire. And what they now do is they just have a little fuse in there to break. So if your battery suddenly stops working, you suspect that it may have been shorted out at some point or even just got wet, it is possible that if you took that cover off that there would be a little blown fuse inside it. But I only mentioned that, I guess you would go and get a new fuse from Radio Spares or somewhere like that. But again, that should be something that the manufacturers are doing. They're not servicing the batteries for us, which is a great shame really, I think. Anyway, that's enough of me rambling on about batteries. I hope you found that interesting and useful. It's a debate, so if you've got anything to add to it, please use the comments box. If you know something about batteries that you think is worth sharing with us, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested to hear. I certainly would. And there's going to be a lot more. We've got that 18 volt drill test coming up. So don't forget to have a look at that as well. And a lot more tool tests coming up on Skill Builder in the very near future. So come back soon and see us. And uh, don't forget to subscribe because not only is it good to have subscribers, but at some point after the 18 volt drill test, we will be giving away a few of the test samples to our lucky subscribers, just by way of thank you to them. Uh, that's when the manufacturers don't want them back. We'll have to ask, obviously, see who wants them back, who doesn't, but hopefully, okay, there'll be a, a tool that's been used, but hopefully there'll still be a bit of value in it. So we pick those lucky winners out of our subscribers and uh, send those off during the course of 2016. Thanks very much for watching. I'm Roger Bisbee and hopefully you come back soon.